The Whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things before I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Western Defense. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Generous host. The evening shadows were lengthening as Steve Neal's jalopy coasted to the curb and came to a stop in a quiet outlying district of Silverton. His eyes surveyed the high wall surrounding the Jameson estate as he wondered if the stories about the eccentric Gerald Jameson, the millionaire ex-silver miner who lived in this huge mansion, were true. Rather interesting stories, too, aren't they, Steve? Suddenly, in the shadows across the street, you see an elderly gentleman facing you, his hands high in the air, and a short, masked man holding a gun on him and rapidly going through his pockets. You jump from your car and race toward the two men. Hey! Hey, you! What are you trying to pull? Put down that gun! The highwayman whirls as you near, hesitates a moment, and then starts running. Hey, you! Stop! You follow, and he turns and then fires. Just over your head. You jump behind a small tree as the man turns and runs rapidly away. Then you walk back to the elderly gentleman. Are you you all right, sir? Yes, thanks to you, young man. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry I couldn't catch him. I'm I... glad you came along just when you oh, did. Well, I didn't. The man was angry because I had no money with me. Why? Then he, he didn't take anything. Only a few dollars. Didn't have much with me. Oh, that was lucky for you. Yes, it was. Young man. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Neal. Steve Neal. Traveling artist. Oh, well, your service. Mr. Neal, more than glad to meet you. Jameson's my name. Jameson? Uh, yes, I... I was just taking an evening stroll. I live here in the house behind these walls. How about joining me in a drink? <laughs> I can use one. Well, uh, if you... No ifs about it, young man. I insist. Come along inside. You are soon seated in the large library of the Jameson Mansion, aren't you, Steve? Listening to Gerald Jameson praises of your heroic rescue as the very sincerely concerned servant, Henry, brings you a drink. Your eyes survey the luxurious surroundings, and you smile to yourself as you realize the possibilities of your new position. You, um, introduced yourself as a traveling artist, Mr. Neal. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I just decided to see the world, Mr. Jameson. Rigged up my jalopy and set out to paint my way around the U.S. Portraits, landscapes, anything. Anything that sells. Hmm. Well, I owe you a lot for what you did a few minutes ago. Oh, not at all. I'm glad I happened along when I did. Then perhaps you'll honor me by painting something for me. Well, since you put it that way, Of course. Sir, uh, consider yourself spoken for, for, uh, let's say, two landscapes and, uh, well, one portrait. Well, you may not like my work. You better check some. I like you, young man. And I know your work will be good. Shall we seal the deal at, uh, what is your price? Oh. Not so good lately. Last one sold for 50. Would uh, 600 be satisfactory for the three? 600? And room and board while you're working. We have ample room here. Oh, this is my lucky day. Sure, sure, it's a deal. <laughs> and just when I didn't know where my next meal was coming from, as the saying goes. And then on back, Steve. <laughs> for a few weeks at least, you'll know where every meal is coming from. Your quick, daring action on Mr. Jameson's behalf solved all your problems, didn't it, Steve? At least temporarily. You decide to take your time on your painting assignment. And as the days pass, you hear some interesting stories about Mr. Jameson, especially the ones concerning his habit of keeping large amounts of cash in his safe at home. You decide your opportunities are greater than you realize. 
and you make it a point whenever possible to watch Mr. Jameson or his trusted servant, Henry, open the safe in the library where your easel faces the wide French window. After a couple of weeks, you're certain you have the combination. But you're in no hurry, are you? No, you plan to continue your work. Wait for the ideal moment. Then one afternoon, as you're putting the finishing touches on your second painting, Mr. Jameson stands and surveys it approvingly. I hope you're as good at portraits as you are at these other things. Portraits? Yes. You see, I had it in mind to have you do a portrait of my niece. Your niece? My sister's girl, Ruth Royce. Oh. She's arriving by train tonight. 24 years old, quite beautiful. Well, if she's coming tonight, I'd better doll up a little for a change, huh? You look okay, except for a shave and a haircut. Oh, I'll get a haircut this afternoon. Wonderful. You too. You're more beautiful than ever. Oh. Uh, Ruth, this is Steve, uh, the Steve Neal I wrote you about. Hello, Steve. Well, nice meeting you, Ruth. Well, what do you think of your portrait so far, Ruth? I like it. So far? Just reflecting a charming subject, that's all. Well, thank you, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Steve. Yeah? There's a telephone call for you. Oh, for me? Uh, yes, sir. Didn't give his name, though. Oh, thanks, Henry. <laughs> Telephone's always interfering with pleasant moments. Don't go away, Ruth. I'll be right back. Hello. Hello, Steve. Yes, who's this? Frankie. I told you not to call me here. You've been paid. Yeah, but not enough, Steve. I gave you what you asked for. We're finished. That's what you think, Steve. Well, what happened if old man Jameson found out we framed that phony holdup you rescued him from? I could tell him all about that, Steve. And some other things, too. You'd better reconsider, friend, and fast. My bankroll's getting low. Real low. The unexpected phone call from Frankie Bixton is more than disturbing, isn't it, Steve? As a guest in the Jameson home, you've not only learned enough about his habits to help yourself to the contents of his safe and make a getaway into Mexico whenever you decide the time is right. You've also found what you think might be the answer to your financial problems for the rest of your life. In the person of Jameson's only living relative and heir, his attractive niece, Ruth Royce. But winning her affections will take time, won't it, Steve? Ruth is an intelligent girl and fully aware that you have nothing to offer her other than yourself. Yes, you'll need time. And Frankie is a dangerous threat to such time, isn't he? You decide you've got to find a way to get rid of him once and for all. Meantime, you decide to see more of Ruth. You're certain she finds you attractive. And one evening in a quiet little cocktail lounge on the outskirts of town, you make your first move. Well... Now that your portrait's about finished, it won't be long I'll be on my way. Going to miss me, Ruth? Probably. It's more than probably with me. I'm going to miss you plenty. Really, Steve? Really. Hey, excuse me, sir. Yeah? What is it, Willie? I'm sorry to interrupt, but a gentleman asked me to tell you he'd like to see you for a few minutes privately. Me? You must be mistaken. I don't think so. He pointed you out. The name is Neil, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Well, uh, t tell him I'll see him some other time. Well, he says it's very important to you, sir. Oh, all right. I'll see him. Excuse me a couple of minutes, will you, Ruth? Of course. Uh, this way, sir. There's a gentleman. There. Thank you. Frankie. You fool. What's the idea of trying to see me here? Mr. Jameson's niece is with me. Yeah, I know. So if I were you, I'd quiet down, get this over with quick. Okay. Make it snappy, will you? Sure, make it real snappy. I need some dough. So do I. Jameson's only paid me for one painting. Yeah, half of that'll do for now. You're out of your mind. Yeah, I guess I'd better see Mr. Jameson. Yep. Okay, okay, Frankie, I guess you win. Will a hundred hold you for a while? Yeah, a little while. Say till you get paid for another painting. Well, it might be tomorrow. It might be next week. Next Monday will be fine. Let's say a hundred then and a hundred the following week, okay? <sighs> guess it has to be. 
How long do you expect this blackmail to keep paying off? <laughs> Not too long. Just till you're all finished with Jameson and his niece. Incidentally, you better be getting back to her, hadn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I had. Wait a minute. See you Monday night, 10 o'clock. Here. Uh, sorry, Ruth. That's all right. Business? Mm, yeah, sir. The fellow heard about my painting and made me a pretty fair proposition. I guess I got to think it over, though. Mm, that's always a good idea. Look, uh, Ruth, how about getting out of here, huh? I can't even build up to a romantic conversation without a waiter button in to tell me some guy wants to talk to me. <laughs> All right, Steve. Anywhere you say. Well, I thought we might drive out to the lake. Kind of like to finish that conversation we were having when that waiter interrupted us. I would too, Steve. This is a lovely spot for a talk. Steve, beautiful moon, rippling water, everything. You were saying something about if you'd met me under different circumstances. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, I just meant that if I'd met you and I didn't know anything about you, uh, before I knew your uncle was a rich man, well, you might believe me if I told you how I felt about you. If I were to tell you now, you'd just think I was an adventurer after your money. And you wouldn't be? No. In my present situation, I, I wouldn't expect you to believe that. There's more to it than your present situation. Steve, there's something strange about you, something that doesn't quite ring true. But what do you mean by that? Well, those phone calls you get every now and then, for instance, and refusing to answer them in a town where you're supposed to be a stranger. And tonight when you came back to our booth from your business conference, you look worried, almost frightened. Oh, well, you just imagine that. I was just thinking, that's all. And as far as those phone calls are concerned, I can explain them, too. Uh, they're just someone I met here in town that I didn't want to talk to. <laughs> You'd laugh if you knew why. I hope so, Steve. I truly hope so. Ruth, you mean I've got a chance? You know you have, or you wouldn't have even brought it up. All I want to know is that you're on the level. What do I have to do to convince you? Oh, that's your problem. But if you really feel about me as you say you do, it shouldn't be very difficult. It'll be easy, honey. But it won't be easy, will it, Steve? No, it'll be almost impossible. And you wonder whether Ruth is worth the effort. That night you lie awake thinking about it. You decide your first problem is Frankie. Toward morning, it suddenly hits you the perfect solution. A solution that will give you time to decide exactly how to make your opportunity with the Jamesons pay off and the additional time to carry out your plan. The following Monday evening at 10 o'clock, you're sitting opposite Frankie in the cocktail lounge where he asked you to meet him. All right, you got my hundred? No. Jameson hasn't paid me for any more pictures. Don't try to hand me that. I'm not handing you anything. Anyway, I've figured out a deal that'll make these hundred dollar shakedowns of yours look like chicken feed. We can both get enough out of it to go to South America and retire for a couple of years. <laughs> Where's the catch? No catch. Now, look, Frankie. Jameson keeps him twenty to $50,000 in his library safe all the time. What about it? I know the combination. Oh, uh, yeah? What else do you know? There's French windows in that library. I can unlock them for you. Give you the safe combination. Just be a robbery by a person or persons unknown. Maybe. What about the split? 50-50. You can mail my half to a guy named Joe Wells, care of the Mid-City Hotel, Bay City. That's me. Mark it hold till arrival. I don't want any part of that dough near me till the heat's off. Probably frisk me, turn everything I got inside out. Someday next week when things are cooled off, I'll drive over, pick up the dough, and powder out of here. Yeah, you figured things okay. Except one. What's that? I don't get this big trust in me. Supposing I go for this setup. Wants to stop me from grabbing the dough and running out on you. In that case, it won't be a robbery by persons unknown. It'll be a robbery by Frankie Bixton. And I got a hunch the cops will find you real quick. With a little help from me. Yeah, I guess that adds up. What do you figure on pulling this off? Tomorrow night? 11 o'clock, right on the dot. Mr. Jameson, Henry, and I will be playing billiards upstairs in the billiard room. Rose will be in bed. She's getting up at 5 the next morning to go horseback riding. 
You can't miss. Yeah. Guess it's worth a chance. Now lay it out for me, huh? Okay. I'll lay it out step by step. Now look. Well, nice shot, Henry. Oh, just luck, sir. Oh, luck, nothing. You handle that cue like a professional. Mother, <laughs> I see what you mean. Uh, wait a minute. Quiet, everybody. What's wrong, Steve? I think I heard somebody in the library. I didn't hear anything. Neither did I, Mr. Steve. It must be your imagination. No, I don't think so. Anyway, I think I'd better investigate. Uh, do you have a revolver, Mr. Jameson? Why... Yes, in the top drawer of the dresser in my bedroom. Good, I... I'll get your gun and sneak downstairs. Now, you and Henry keep right on playing billiards as though nothing had happened. If anyone is down there, I... No, just a minute, Steve. That's dangerous. Don't worry, I'll be careful. And keep the game going. Go ahead. Okay, Frankie, keep quiet and keep your hands where I can see them. Steve, that's right. How much did you get? Around 20 grand, I think. What's the idea? Now, pull that plant out of that pot there by the roots, and all you have to do is lift it. I loosened the dirt and it wet it down an hour ago. Now, wait a minute. All right, now, come on, move. I can let you have it, and you'll be another dead burglar. Double cross, huh? I said move. Okay. Now... Out those French windows, Frankie. Look, Steve. Come on, get going. Hey, you! You, you stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Steve! Steve, what happened? Are you hurt? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Jameson, but he got away. Well, you did your best, Steve, and I won't forget it. Oh, thank you, sir. Ruth, you'd better phone the sheriff while I examine the safe and see what's missing. When the sheriff and his deputies arrive, you spend some anxious moments as they question you and examine the premises. But everything worked out exactly as you planned. You breathe a sigh of relief when they ignore the wet flower pot and leave. You're sure that by morning no one can tell the plant was tampered with. By one o'clock you've retired for the night. But you're worried and a little frightened, aren't you, Steve? You know that Frankie knows you tried to kill him. And you know that he'll be around again and soon. You decide to stay close to the estate until you're ready to take the stolen money, forget about Ruth, and leave Silverton. A few days later... That uh, about does it, Mr. Jameson. I can't polish it anymore. The portrait's excellent, Steve. Oh. You have real talent. Well, I'm glad you like it, Mr. Jameson. What about you, Ruth? Satisfied? Yes, I like it. Well, then I do, too. Now, I guess it's goodbye. Well... Goodbye. Goodbye? I'm afraid so. My work's done. It's time for me to move on. But there's no hurry. Afraid there is, sir. Say, I've been offered a job on the coast as a commercial artist, and I've decided to take it. I'll be leaving day after tomorrow. Just before dinner that evening, Mr. Jameson calls you aside, and as a reward for your bravery tries to persuade you to accept an additional $500 for the paintings you've completed. When you decline, you're certain from the expression on his face that he's pleased at your decision. Jameson treats you almost like a son, doesn't he, Steve? You spend most of the next day in your room, ostensibly writing letters and packing your few belongings. That evening after dinner, you chat pleasantly with Jameson and Ruth until nearly midnight. When they finally decide to retire... You tell them you're going to enjoy a midnight snack and then check your car. As soon as you're sure they're asleep, you go into the library, remove the stolen money from the flower pot, go outside to the garage and stuff the bills under the cover of the driver's seat. Then as you turn around... I'm going somewhere, Steve. Huh? Frankie. Yeah. You're not such a good shot. Well, I was just putting on an act. You know that. Your act was too good this time. You were trying to knock me off. Oh, no, no, you're all wrong. I've been Frank... waiting to get you, Steve. And this is it. As Frankie starts towards you, you see a knife blade flash in the moonlight. You're standing with a car door open, and your hand closes around a wrench in the front seat. You lunge directly toward Frankie, and your surprise attack throws him off balance. As he stumbles, you strike him on the head and watch him fall forward and lie still. 
After what seems hours, you realize he's dead. For a moment, you're panicky. And then relieved to know he's permanently out of the way. Quickly, you open the trunk lid of your car and place his body inside. And then lean against the car and light a cigarette. Who's that? Who's there? It's me, Steve. Who? What are you doing here? I couldn't sleep. I thought I might take a little drive. Oh. Why? Oh, I, I couldn't sleep either. Steve. Yes? I'm kind of glad you're out here. I wanted you to know something before you left. I, I think you're on the level. Ruth, you mean it? I mean it. Well, thanks, Ruth. I... Well, it's all I can say right now. Just, just thanks. Do you still want to leave? Take that job on the coast? I have to, Ruth. But I'll be back, honey. Soon. Well, Steve, your mission in Silverton is accomplished, isn't it? You have $20,000 under the seat covers of your car. And when that's spent, you're certain you can come back and marry Ruth Royce, the niece and only relative of your wealthy benefactor, Gerald Jameson. And even though the body of the man you killed, Frankie Bixton, is in the trunk of your car, you're not worried, are you, Steve? No, you're certain that once you're on your way, you can find a lonely stretch of road where you can easily dispose of this important link to your part in the successful robbery of the Jameson safe. Next morning, after a lengthy breakfast, Mr. Jameson and Ruth accompany you out the front door and around the house to the drive. Well, who does this belong to? You, Steve. It's all yours, fully equipped. When you refused to allow me to pay you what I thought your paintings were worth, I decided to make it up to you in some other way. The uh, surprise part was Ruth's idea. Uh, certainly a surprise, all right. As soon as you sign these transfer papers, it'll be all yours. You like it, don't you, Steve? Oh, sure, sure. But what about my old jalopy here? Where is it? Uh, Mr. Burke drove it back to the garage when he delivered this new station wagon for you early this morning. Well, how could I? It was locked. I, I still have the keys. Uh, uh, Henry had an extra key made when you let him drive your old car into town yesterday. Well, what's the matter, Steve? You look so strange. Oh, nothing, nothing. Except getting a new station wagon is quite a shock. Besides, I had so much personal stuff in that old jalopy of mine, I, I think I'd better check on it before I leave. Where is it? At the Main Street garage. Uh, but it looks like it won't be necessary for you to go after it, Steve. It's uh, turning into the drive right now. And Sheriff Wilson is driving. Now, what do you suppose the sheriff's doing in that old jalopy of yours, Steve? The Whistler. Listen next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. The Whistler has come to you through the worldwide facility.